severe weather and brutal summer heat returning to the forecast as we reach the middle of May. Still about three to four weeks to go before the Great Plains severe weather season tapers off, and it's been a slow start due to a persistent Hudson Bay vortex and a blocking pattern that's been with us over the past week. And this is what we're talking about. We go up to 500 millibars, and this is a rather wavy pattern. This is what we call meridional. And we've got one large trough moving through the Rockies and this persistent cutoff low over the eastern Great Lakes. That's been with us for probably five or six days, I think. Anyway, just looking very quickly ahead, this trough does start breaking down that block there. We get more into a progressive pattern. But it looks like in the extended, we'll be back to some more blocking. There it is for late next week. As this area of low heights settles underneath this ridge in the Hudson Bay region. On the current surface map, we can see things are really picking up in the high plains, a large Pacific system coming out of Colorado and an active dry line extending into Oklahoma and Texas. Some very warm temperatures as you go south, 100s around San Antonio, Austin, Sanderson, Del Rio, and 110 at the Synoptic Observatory in Monterey, Mexico. That's way down at the bottom there. Some cool conditions moving into the western states, lots of 50s and 60s and even 40s in the higher terrain of the uh, Bitterroots and the northern Rockies. In the northeast, we see that old cutoff low opening up into a broad area of thermal troughing, helping to generate this extensive area of shower activity. A wide range of temperatures as well. We saw mid-80s across northern Maine but low 60s in the New York City area, even 50s in the Poconos. A marginal risk of severe thunderstorms extends across much of Virginia. You can see those convective cells down there. Isolated hail and straight line winds are possible. Marginal risk extending into the Midwest as well. There's a look at the current radar. You probably noticed that there's a north-northeast movement and that's parallel to this axis of precipitation. So there is extensive training going on, and that means a heightened flash flood risk. As you go further south, stronger cells with severe thunderstorm warnings through parts of central North Carolina. There's a look at the southeast region on satellite. It's a little bit hard to see, but the enhanced risk is right in here. And these cells popping up there in North Carolina, right within that. And off to the west, yeah, that's a plume of dust coming out of Arkansas and Texas that passed over Dallas this morning, and it originated yesterday from a dust storm in the El Paso area. Well, no dust storm today, but we are getting the enhanced upper level winds, 120 knot jet max moving through El Paso at this time, and you can see that transverse mountain wave banding. Now, one thing that we do have is the heat out in South Texas. Let's take a look at that. There's the current station plots, and they were forecasting 107 for San Antonio this afternoon, and we're near the peak for the day. So I think they've been over forecasting these temperatures just a little bit. Maybe the cloud cover has affected that as well. A good dry line push out there in West Texas. The actual dry line itself that appears to be poorly defined through central Texas, and it becomes easier to resolve as you get into Oklahoma. It's going to be right in here, maybe just, what's that, just west of Wichita, down to the Oklahoma City area, and down to about Decatur and Bowie. And where's that cold front? We have to go into New Mexico for that. To find that cold front, you want to look at the temperatures. We go down to 85 degrees, 87, 84. So this is all fairly homogenous. But you get out towards Klein's Corner and Santa Rosa, it drops significantly down into the 70s and the 60s. So that's getting into the colder air. Similar situation out there in southern New Mexico. I'll just draw that out for you right there. I think that's going to be the cold front. So 88, 86, 86, all the way to Deming then it falls off. 
so that is the Pacific Air, which has been heavily modified. And we'll just jump right to the southwestern U.S. right there. Cold advection through the entire area west of the Rockies. Most of New Mexico under an assortment of wind advisories and red flag warnings, especially around Albuquerque and Roswell. Southwest winds gusting the 50 miles an hour this afternoon. High wind warnings in the Sacramento Mountains for winds to 60 miles an hour. Further west, the Arizona deserts rather cool into the mid-80s this afternoon. 60s and low 70s in the four corners. And there's some of those cold advection showers across Utah. In California, 70s in the San Joaquin Valley, a few 80s down around Bakersfield in the, in the eastern deserts, but overall, a fairly nice day. In the northwestern U.S., cool conditions prevailed. Afternoon highs in the 60s for the most part, with 50s in the bitter roots, uh, as far as the valleys, obviously colder up in the mountains. We did see some 70s, a little bit of maybe lee side warming east of the Cascades, out in the Columbia Basin. Winter storm warning continues for the mountains south of, I think that's off the screen there. Why don't we just switch to that? Yeah, so the uh, mountains south of Livingston, I think that's the Absaroka Range. Winter storm warning through tonight, one to two feet of new snow possible. And in the Bighorn Mountains, right in this area right here, four to eight inches of snow above 7,000 feet through tomorrow night. And looks like some thunderstorms popping up out there in the Dakotas. And we do have a slight risk for that area. A severe thunderstorm watch is out for parts of central South Dakota into the North Platte area. There's a current look at the radar. Two strong thunderstorms in north central Nebraska. They have severe thunderstorm warnings on those. And those are for, if I can get that to come up, golf ball sized hail with high winds. There's a look at the visible satellite imagery. You can see all that growth along that boundary right there. And at the very end, looks like additional cells are about to pop up right around North Platte, maybe just a tiny bit east of there. So it will be an active afternoon and evening tonight. And if we go back to the radar and look at the velocity and take that up to a higher tilt, you can visualize the shear in the environment. So this is a classic kind of a corkscrewing pattern that indicates ample levels of SRH. However, one bit of information, if we look at the uh, cursor here, let me get this where you can read it off the bottom. Yeah, this shows the cursor display height in AGL. So there we're right over the radar. That's uh, well, it doesn't show it right near the radar. But as you get out toward this area here, this is where we start to get that directional turning of the winds. That's going to be up at about 4,500 feet. So the better SRH is actually in the 0 through 2 kilometer range, not the 0 through 1 kilometer range. So that's a minor negative factor. However, plenty of instability. There's certainly good bulk shear and just, you know, a decent amount of SRH, but through a rather deep layer. So that is the grand picture. There's that dust out there in Mississippi. We head out into the Pacific, a large 1033, 1034 millibar high, and the Gulf of Alaska is stormy again, a 987 millibar low near the Aleutians, and northeasterly flow across Alaska itself, but no significant weather. More cold air on the way south through the Northwest Territories and Nunavut. Temperatures up there in the teens and 20s. But you go further south and we do have a heat warning out in parts of southeastern Manitoba, far southwestern Ontario, including Kenora and Dryden. That's the first Canadian heat wave of the season. Temperatures 82 to 90 degrees. That heat wave is only for today. Also some heat out there in Quebec and New Brunswick, temperatures approaching 90 degrees this afternoon. But up to the north, very stormy near the Ungava Bay region, Baffin Island, we have a variety of blizzard warnings and snowfall warnings.
Well, what are we concerned about in mid-May? Obviously, thunderstorms. And I think the 850 millibar chart is one of my favorites for looking at the overall picture. And what we see for today is strong southwesterly flow invading Texas and Oklahoma. And, of course, that's associated with downslope conditions and adiabatic warming. So let's see what happens over the next few days. You can see the Gulf is open. We're starting to get this little piece coming into South Texas overnight, into Arkansas, Tennessee. So that may support some thunderstorms across that region, although I've not assessed the thermodynamic profile. But some of that will be making it up into the Midwest. So in other words, that's going to be the moisture supply. And of course, we've got the strong occlusion in the Dakotas, so in between triple point and the possibility for severe weather. Very strong cyclonic flow through the Dakotas, 60 knots up there at 850 millibars. That's pretty impressive. That'll sweep into the Great Lakes, and you can see the Gulf is open, but this is more of a summertime type pattern, not very energetic. However, things do pick up for Sunday. Low-level jet starting to form there, 30 knots across Oklahoma. Then going into Monday, picking up even more in the central and northern plains with this next system emerging from the Rockies. Another surge of moisture and southerly flow working into the central plains for midweek. That lifts north. Offshore flow for Thursday, so kind of a mixed bag through the week. And then we pick up again for the following weekend. So nothing here is really screaming, a big outbreak. But this time of year, you never know. And the models, of course, may be wrong, especially once you get up past 168 hours. Let's take a quick look at that precipitable water. Lots of 1 to 1.5 inch amounts through the lower plains into the eastern U.S., and of course, overnight, we're going to build that low-level jet back up through Texas, Arkansas, into Illinois, supporting tomorrow's severe weather. And those precipitable water amounts running about 1 to 1.5 all the way to Lake Michigan. As we go into the weekend, let's see here. We've got 1 to 2 inches from Texas into the deep south, so abundant moisture. Again, I did not really see a very deep and well-established low-level jet, but this will be enough to support some thunderstorm activity if we're not capped. Looks like we finally clear out that moisture around Tuesday or Wednesday. Strong push of cool. Well, I'm not sure it's going to be all that cool, but uh, certainly Pacific origin air with dry characteristics as you go south. And we will pretty much clear out a lot of that moisture towards Friday and Saturday, and then towards the weekend, some of it coming back up for May 23rd, 24th, and 25th. So let's take a look at that severe situation for tomorrow, starting out with 6 or 7 in the morning. So that's the picture. Low pressure in South Dakota, strong southerly flow through the Midwest. And we go into the afternoon and the model here, the HRW FE3, forecasting development across Wisconsin in the afternoon. And already painting out some supercell-like signatures. Let's go back a couple of hours and look at the forecast soundings. And those definitely do look supercellular. We do see strong SRH right there in the 0 through 1 kilometer layer and very good SRH in the 0 through 2 kilometer layer capping, which will help keep the cells a little bit discreet. Capes running about 2,000, so that's moderate. And the D capes, those are in the 1,200 range. So some outflow dominance, the possibility for generation of cold pools and some rather complex structures, but at least some of these are likely to produce tornadoes. And then we go into the afternoon and evening. Those will be moving into the Green Bay area. Definite possibility for severe weather there, as far north as Ashland also, and other cells into western Michigan. And then we lose the daytime heating. It looks like some continuation of severe structures going into the early evening. And those should congeal into an MCS as we go into the overnight hours as things become more and more forced. All right, let's take a look at that forecast. Stormy in the Dakotas, 
the agricultural districts there getting some beneficial rains to start out the season. Cold in the Great Basin area, overnight lows in the 30s as far south as Cedar City, the Mogollon Rim, Gallup in Santa Fe. In the lower valleys and central high plains, looking at 40s for tonight, Denver 45 and Salt Lake City 44. As we go through Thursday, you can see that frontal system moving into the Midwest. By morning, it should be approaching Iowa, Des Moines, moving through Kansas City and the cold front extending all the way through Oklahoma City and San Angelo. The axis of heat shifts into Arkansas and Illinois. We're gonna see widespread 90s through that area tomorrow. And the Storm Prediction Center has an enhanced risk of severe weather that covers much of Wisconsin, and we also have a slight risk across the rest of the Great Lakes down into eastern Illinois and into the Paducah area, western Kentucky, and much of Ohio as well. Tornado outbreak certainly possible there in Wisconsin. Let me take you up to the evening hours. That's going to be the setup in early afternoon and then evening looking like this, and the GFS may be a little bit too fast with this. The heat wave continues in South Texas. We knock a few degrees off the temperatures, only 100 for Austin and San Antonio. For Friday, we start breaking down that blocking pattern and all the systems start moving a little bit more progressively. The tail end of this front, however, not really doing a whole lot. The Storm Prediction Center has upgraded the severe weather possibilities on Friday. This area runs from southeastern Missouri into far southwestern Ohio. Some supercells are possible, but the tornado potential is not clear. Lots of rain all up through the central and northern Appalachians, and some rather substantial upper air energy starts impacting the northwestern U.S. as a deep westerly polar jet with 130 knot winds approaches the Oregon coast. So we take that into the evening. And there's those thunderstorm cells from Michigan down to Indiana. Additional cells possible all the way down towards the Memphis area. For Saturday, cold air spreads into the northeastern U.S. There's the evening map, 549 decameters across southern Ontario. Meanwhile, hot in Texas, the GFS going for some thunderstorms along this frontal boundary around Dallas. A big increase in rain across the western U.S., thermal troughing all down the west coast, and a frontal system in California and Nevada. Then for Sunday, cold air spreading into Utah and Arizona, so a little bit cooler, with mid-80s in the southwest deserts. The upper level low begins shearing off in Nevada, so it's going to be unsettled through that area once again. The snow levels possibly down to about 6,000 to 7,000. Extensive rains through the northern plains Sunday into Monday. And another frontal system interacting with that Gulf moisture so we could see a severe weather day once again for early next week. For Tuesday, severe weather possibly spreading up into the Midwest, similar to tomorrow. Cool, dry advection for the midweek period. And then return flow gets going once again as we end into Friday and Saturday. And that concludes this edition of Forecast Lab. A special thanks to our newest supporters, Chris Wallace, Daniel Young, and Troy Wisman. I appreciate that support, and that will pretty much be all. So we'll see you back here on Friday for another episode. Take care and stay safe. Bye-bye.